Well, good morning, Resolve Church family. Morning. morning. Yeah, I'm liking the responsiveness to that. My name is Ryan Buss. I'm one of the pastors here at the Resolve Church, and I am coming at the very tail end of a cold, so this is my best friend right now, little lemon and honey. So if you're new, I just want to extend a very special welcome. I'm delighted that you're with us this morning, and my, my desire and my hope is that you feel like you've come home. Perhaps you've been looking for a new church for a while, or perhaps you just moved here from another city or another state, and you're looking to to feel rooted and grounded in this new city. And I just want to say, you're home. You're home. We just met you, and we already love you. I love you, and I just met you. Just imagine how much more you'll be loved as you get to know us better. And if you're new, I just want to kind of catch us up just a little bit on where we've been. Um, in the, kind of the middle of January, our primary preaching pastor, Pastor Dwayne, started a new sermon series through chapter 23 of the book of Psalms. The most well-loved, well-known chapter, probably in the Bible, and it is an amazing one, isn't it? I mean, we've been working through it like word by word, phrase by phrase. We just got done with the first sentence. We're making good headway. But it has been a humongous blessing, an absolute joy to actually take God's word and just really chew on it. Have you ever done that before? Just chew on a word or a phrase. Let the Lord minister to you through that. And that's what we're going through as a church. Uh, we gave Pastor Dwayne two weeks off from preaching. And so last week, our, uh, our church planting resident, Chris Sandoval, I uh, preached on service, really developing a theology of service. So we were created by God to serve. We were created by God to serve Him. We were created by God to serve one another. We find our greatest joy, satisfaction in life in serving one another and serving others. This morning, we're going to be taking a look at hospitality. Really, it's just an extension of service. An expression of serving others is hospitality. And before we begin... I just want to give a little brief definition of hospitality. We should have it on the screen here. Hospitality, it's the welcoming in and provision for guests, whether it be family, friends, or strangers. Say that one more time. Hospitality is the welcoming in and the provision for guests, whether this be family or friends or strangers. When we think of hospitality here in in our nation, of course, we think of The great scene we have in San Diego, right, of amazing restaurants with great food and drink, the beautiful hotels and the Airbnbs and the bed and breakfast and all kinds of ways that we have hospitality in this great city. I think we crush it with regards to the hospitality industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry in the country. But really, hospitality, historically, has really been centered in the home, has been centered in the houses of families. That's where hospitality really developed. And throughout history, every single culture of mankind has developed its own little rules and nuances for showing good hospitality. Of course, you know, there's some social stigmas and even some punishments for breaking those rules. In fact, the ancient Greeks attributed the virtue of hospitality to their main god of their pantheon, Zeus. It was a divine quality. And in every culture, we see that this plays to be true. Hospitality is a virtue, something to be aspired to. We as a church really have a value, a high value for hospitality, extending the hospitality of God to those who become part of our house. That's because we really believe that hospitality is, first and foremost, a characteristic of God himself. Any good hospitality we experience at all is meant to point us to Jesus. Any hospitality we experience ever is really ultimately to point us to Jesus. And this is what I've titled the sermon for this morning is the hospitality of Christ. Just simple, hospitality of Christ. And we'll be taking a look at that through the lens of John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to John chapter 14. We'll have it on the screen as well. I'll go ahead and read it. I'll declare it as God's word. We'll, as a church family, we'll thank him for it together, and I'll pray over it. 
This is John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for showing us your hospitality, for extending your hospitality to us, troubled sinners. Jesus, thank you for showing us what this hospitality looks like. Jesus, thank you for welcoming us in and for inviting us and for bringing us into your house this morning. And Jesus, I want to just pray and ask for us as we look at your word, Would you help us to really experience that hospitality in a fresh way this morning? And Jesus, as we experience the welcome and the reception that we have in you, that we would be extending that and welcoming others into our lives and into our church house. Thank you for your word, Lord Jesus. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen. All right, well, I have uh, three abodes, three houses that we're going to be looking at and focusing on as we work through our text. Grandma's house, which is the father's house, hashtag the father's house. Uh, We have the dorm room, which is like our hearts. And then we have church house, which is really our response. That's where we're going. And before I begin really getting into the text, um, I just want to say that the father's house, the father's house, this this house that Jesus describes here in verse 2, this Father's house, man, it's the most desired place for our souls. It is the most necessary place for our lives. It's desirable. It's greater than any other house or any other dwelling place that our souls could find. And it is more necessary for our hearts than anything else we can search for here on earth. Because outside of the Father's house is only darkness and weeping, gnashing of teeth. It's, it's not a desirable place to be. Only in the Father's house do we have refuge and safety. And when I'm thinking of a desirable place to be, a place where I have rest, a place where I have warmth and love, comfort, lots of food, I think of my grandma's house, Right? Think of a little three-bedroom house on Decatur Avenue in Daytona Beach, Florida. I, wasn't, I didn't grow up in Florida, uh, but we would go and make trips often to go visit my grandma. And man, that's a place of love. It was a place of warmth, not just because it was in Florida, although that certainly helped, but just relationally, it was a place of warmth. It was a place of lots of food. I mean, it's like she was fattening me up for something. Tons of food. I mean, just well provided for. Lots of fun, right? I, I learned the classic childhood games of cribbage and skippo at my grandma's house. It's a desirable place. It was a place where when I was there, you know, whatever was troubling me in my heart, in my life, whatever was a burden to me, it just kind of faded away when I was there. And I could just be. It was, a, it was like a refuge. It was a place of safety for me. And these are things that we see in the Father's house. How do we know what the Father's house is like? How do we know what kind of a reception or what kind of welcome we have from the Father? Well, we don't need to go any further than to look at Jesus. We don't need to go any further than to look at Jesus, the kind of reception, the kind of welcome that Jesus gives us. Just a couple of verses down from our own text. Jesus says, from now on, you do know him, meaning the Father, and have seen him, meaning the Father, because they've known and seen Jesus. Even in our text, Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house. The Father and Jesus are one. What kind of welcome, what kind of reception does Jesus give us? Well, first off, It's a gracious welcome. It's a gracious reception. We see this with the disciples. Jesus starts off with, 
let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Jesus, aware of what's going on in his disciples' hearts, he sees, he pierces right through all of the exterior, right into the very heart of his disciples, and see it's troubled. They're in turmoil. It's anxious. They're worried. They're fearful. They're doubting. He pierces right through it and sees it. And he gives the remedy for that. It's an invitation to once more put your trust in Jesus, to once more remember the Father's house. The promise of the Father's house is the remedy for their troubled souls. And they had a lot to be worried about. Uh, Chapter 14 really lies in what's called the upper room discourse, where Jesus is at the last supper with his disciples. Judas Iscariot had just gone to betray Jesus. Jesus told them, hey, someone's going to betray me to death, and they're afraid. Peter makes this declaration that he's going to go to death and die for Jesus, and Jesus is like, no, you're not. You're not going to die for me. In fact, you're going to deny me. Oh, what kind of a fear might the disciples be facing? Here is God. Here is their best friend. Here is the word of God made flesh, and he's going to die? Well, he'd been telling them all week that he was going to be arrested and die and rise again. I mean, their minds are troubled, and this is true for us, friends. We have all kinds of things that are plaguing our minds and our hearts, all kinds of troubles and burdens and anxieties and troubles. Our hearts might be in turmoil this very morning, wrestling with this and that. And Jesus extends the invitation into the Father's house to his disciples. Remember the promise of the Father's house. And it wasn't just for his disciples. I mean, this was a tenor of Jesus' life. In Luke chapter 15, verse 2, we have this description. And the Pharisees and scribes, they grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. That word receives is the word welcomed. Jesus welcomed sinners into his presence, and then he ate with them. How the hyper-religious, super-holy Pharisees didn't want to have anything to do with the scumbags and the lowest of the low and the sinners and the prostitutes and the tax collectors. Didn't want anything to do with them. But Jesus, God, the Holy One, welcomed sinners into his presence. And he ate with them. Eating is such a bonding experience, isn't it? That's why it's sometimes awkward to ask your coworker to go to lunch with you, right? I gotta be friends with this guy? It's weird sometimes. But there is. There's a bonding with eating. Jesus is welcoming sinners into his presence and eating with them. What he's doing is extending this gracious welcome, this merciful welcome into his presence. One of the ways that I got to experience this in my life, just sort of on a a practical level, and when I was thinking about this kind of welcome reception that Jesus gives troubled sinners, just in a practical play out, I think of my wife's grandma, her nana. So my wife and I dated twice in college, the first time because I messed it up. Uh, It was full of sin and full of deceit and selfishness and lies and immaturity. And then I broke up with her, and it hurt her deeply. And not just her, but hurt her family. She and her family are very, very, very close. And one of the persons in my wife's life who walked with her closely through that time of pain that I caused because of my sin was her grandma, who's with the Lord now, and is an amazing woman of Jesus. Walked with my wife, saw the pain, saw the hurt, and by extension was hurt because of it. And so when God did a miraculous healing in both of our lives to the point where we wanted to date again and even get married, a work of redemption, a work of transformation in both my life and my wife's life, one of the very first family events I went to was a Christmas banquet. I was super, super nervous, right? Because I had hurt the family, right? And th- I mean, this is like Hispanic, man, like, You don't hurt the family. 
<laughs> for real. I was, I was so nervous. I'm like, I'm like a normally like a fighter, you know, like I like to fight in relationships and whatever. And I was super nervous. Um, so I, I went to this family banquet and they were all there and they had all walked with my wife through this terrible period that I'd caused in their family. And one of the amazing things is her grandma extended welcome to me. A blessing. Despite the hurt, despite the pain that I had caused, she welcomed me in. And she fed me so much menudo and tamales, <laughs> so much, that I, I can't even think about Christmas without thinking that now. It, it just it is embedded in my mind. But she was compassionate, merciful, gracious. That turned the rest of the family to actually like me. So I wasn't this crazy gringo coming into the Hispanic family. And it really left uh, just an indelible mark on how I view hospitality. I got to experience it in my own life. And this is what Jesus is doing for the disciples. This is what Jesus is doing for sinners. This is what Jesus is doing for you and for me this morning. Extending the gracious welcome of the Father despite whatever sin and hurt you've done against him. But how is he able to do this? How is Jesus, the Holy One, able to welcome sinners into his presence and eat with them? Well, this we see in verse 2 and in verse 3, where Jesus says, If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you? Really, the key word there is the key word prepare, that Jesus is going to prepare a place. That word, of course, is similar to how we understand it, just going on ahead and preparing a place to receive people. That Jesus has gone ahead and prepared the way to be able to receive sinners into his holy presence. And Jesus sent his disciples to prepare the room for the Last Supper. God had sent John the Baptist to prepare the way ahead of Jesus so that people would actually be able to receive Jesus in spirit and truth. And we see Jesus going on ahead of us and preparing the way ahead of us in three ways, three primary ways. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, we see the writer of Hebrews saying this about Jesus. He's saying, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner, as a forerunner on our behalf. He's gone on a, as a forerunner in three ways, in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. He lived the life that we all meant to live, perfect, without sin, and yet we all failed at it. But Jesus says that he was in every respect been tempted, yet was without sin. He lived the perfect life relationally, obedience, submission, humility to the Father because we can't live it. Jesus went on ahead of us and died on, our, on a cross on our behalf. He died the death that we deserve for not being able to live the life. And we see that he is, in fact, the firstborn from the dead. Colossians 1.18 says that Jesus, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He has gone on ahead of us to prepare the way because, you see, the problem is that apart from Jesus' preparation, we cannot be received by the Father. We cannot be welcomed by the Father because sin creates a barrier. Sin creates a separation. Really, apart from Jesus preparing the way and then inviting us in, we will be cast out to the outer darkness. But Jesus, in his perfect life, gives that life to us. And in his death, takes the punishment for sin so that now we don't relate with God in his anger or his judgment. We can relate to God in his mercy, in his compassion, and in his love, his resurrection, this eternal, new, beautiful, recreated, glorious life is given to us freely by his grace. Any barrier at all to the Father's house has been removed by Jesus, going on ahead of us, 
graciously welcoming us, receiving us. Beautiful. Where are you at this morning? We see the invitation of Jesus. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Are your hearts troubled? Is there sin that clings so closely to your life? Receive Jesus' gracious welcome into the house of God, into the family house, the dwelling place of God. And once we experience this hospitality, this gracious welcome, now we can extend that actually to other people. Right? We can extend that same hospitality to others. We can give that hospitality away. And this is kind of the topic for my next point, which is the dorm room. But receiving the hospitality and giving it away, it all starts in the heart, right? Good hospitality starts in the heart. And I've titled this the dorm room because of the image that it evokes in our minds of a small, dirty, messy, very cluttered little place. I've been involved in college ministry now for well over 10 years, and I've seen a lot of dorm rooms in my time. And I know that not all of the dorm rooms are this way. I was even talking with Pastor Dwayne this week, and he said that wasn't how his dorm room was like, but he did agree that this is how dorm rooms are, by and large. And I use this as an analogy of our hearts because really of how dirty and messy and cluttered and small our hearts are, just like a dorm room. That really we find it quite difficult to invite and welcome others into our lives. Our lives tend to be really self-centered and insular. Equating our hearts to a house or to a room is something that Scripture also does. Later on in John chapter 14, Jesus, he has this to say about him and the Father and those who would believe in him and their dwelling place, actually. John 14, 23, Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. That first we must receive the hospitality of Christ. But we find, and we give it away, and we find that it's actually really hard to do that. We're self centered, small in our thinking, a lot of barriers to that. But hospitality in the heart of it, you can feel it, right? Like you can feel when someone is is being hospitable and welcoming you into their lives. I uh, teach music lessons um, part time. I actually have a lot of music students, so it's more than part-time. But I teach music lessons in people's homes. I have the privilege of being able to go all over the city and teach a lot of different kids. Right now, it's piano and clarinet. But when I was thinking about the heart behind hospitality and kind of the heart behind extending it to others, I thought of two families that I've had the privilege of teaching. One was one of the very first families, actually, that I taught, um, They lived in a very, very low-income housing apartment complex in El Cajon. It was super sketch, and I felt kind of awkward going to their apartment every single week to teach their daughter piano. But man, I loved being there. I loved being there. You know, it started with, I had to take off my shoes before going inside the apartment. That will make you feel cozy, padding around in barefoot and socks in a stranger's home. I loved it. In the, in the summer months, you know, they would give me ice cream or popsicles or frozen yogurt while I taught their daughter. It felt kind of weird sometimes because she didn't eat it, but I was eating it in front of her. But <laughs> I didn't care. <laughs> it was good. And it was hot. Uh, and, and during the cooler months, you know, they'd serve me hot tea with, like, cakes and stuff. And I was like, man. And they would ask me how I was doing, and we'd talk. And you could just tell that the way that they related to each other was so much love and warmth, that regardless of what the place was like, I I just loved being there. And then I have this other family that I taught. Great place. Huge house in La Jolla. Awesome house. 
awesome view. You'd think, yeah, this place would be awesome to live. And it was so awkward to go to their house every single week and teach because the way they related with one another was so cold, was so performance-driven, even with their kids. And I just felt like uncomfortable being there. After the hour of teaching, I'd be like, oh, man, I'm so glad I'm out of there. You could tell. The heart behind it is so important. The place is really subservient to the heart behind it. It is important for us to cultivate this heart of hospitality before we can truly extend that to other people. I mean, Jesus focuses on the disciples' hearts. That's where he starts. John 14, 1, let not your hearts be troubled. He starts there. We also need to start there. We were really created by God to relate with him and to relate with others, to welcome others into our lives. And yet, as I've mentioned already, sin creates this barrier. It creates this barrier to actually welcoming people in, being able to truly relate authentically. I'd like to just focus on three barriers briefly that we have that prevent us from truly extending the hospitality of Christ to others. The first is the fear of rejection or the fear of judgment from others. This is the fear that as you initiate toward another person, especially someone who's new, there's going to be this fear that they're going to reject you. They might even judge you because you're different. Maybe you feel like you're weird. You've got some quirks. Like learning the dwarvish rune system of Middle Earth in high school. Not that I would have anything to do with that. You just There's fear there. Maybe there's fear of not stacking up, that you're inadequate to be their friend. You, know, you look at their life and be like, oh, man, how could they be friends with me? They're so much cooler than me. They, they dress so much better than me. They've got greater hair, a greater career, a better car, or whatever. There's this weird comparison game. You feel like you just don't measure up, and so you never actually move toward another person out of that fear. Perhaps it's self-protection. Maybe you've been hurt so many times over the years. Maybe you've been abused over the years. And you've created walls around yourself. You've created these ways of protecting yourself so that you don't get hurt anymore. Perhaps you cut off relationships before they hurt you. And no one ever gets to know the true and authentic and the real you. You just simply project this image of what you think others want to see. Or perhaps it's self-centeredness and pride. Believe that you are the most important person in your universe. Or that you have this extremely high and lofty opinion of yourself. You look down upon others. Really, your pride, your self-centeredness, you being the center of your universe, is keeping you from enriching your lives with other people. Really, this prevents us from truly being aware of others. Taking an interest in others' lives and investing our time in their lives. So how does Jesus break down these barriers? We see how he went ahead and made the preparations to receive troubled sinners into the Father's house. Here we can see that Jesus also transforms our lives, transforms these barriers, breaks them down, that we can truly extend the hospitality of Christ to others. With regards to the fear of rejection or judgment, man, the only person that we really ought to fear his judgment is God. And as we saw in the first point, that judgment is gone. Jesus received that for us. It is gone. The Father accepts you just as you are. He delights in you. He desires you. Man, if that isn't cause for finding my full identity in God the Father accepts me as I am? I don't need to fear him. Why do I need to fear man? It removes that barrier. With self-protection, we see that Christ is truly our protector. You know, Jesus was hurt and he was abused. He's able to empathize with our abuse. But he's also a victor. And he stands in, in peace and victory. He's a defender for the defenseless. He's able to take those hurting, those broken places of our hearts and minds that we are trying to protect 
is able to actually transform them into beauty. He's actually able to transform them for his glory. And with him as my protector, I, I can actually be honest. I can be real with another person. I do not need to fear them or protect myself. I have Jesus defending me and protecting me. With our self-centeredness and pride, I mean, Jesus is truly the center of all of existence. There's no other being so magnificent, so beautiful, so rich in love and power and wisdom than Jesus. For through him and by him and to him are all things. He is the king. And this king left his throne and came and served us and gave his life for you and for me that we might be welcomed and received into the Father's house. And if that doesn't cause you to pause and to want to give him glory and honor, there is no other cause more worthy or more glorious than that. We see that now he is to be the center of our lives, the whole purpose for our lives to show off Jesus and to help others know this hospitality of Jesus. And what is the end result? What is the end result of this hospitality as we receive it in our hearts, and as we seek to extend that to others, welcoming others into our lives first? John 14, 3, the end of our text, Jesus says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, he has, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. That where I am, you may be also. Friends, the end result is to be with Jesus. That we're with him. There is, there is nothing else sweeter. There's nothing else more defining or purposeful or satisfying than being with Jesus. That we get to be with him now and into eternity. That's amazing. We can experience this in our own lives. And we get to experience this and express this as a community. And this brings me to my third point, my final point, which is church house, but really our response. We see this in verse 2. Where Jesus says, in my Father's house are many rooms. So in our first point, we looked at kind of the quality of the house, right? The Father's house, the welcome and the preparation of Jesus we receive. See, that starts in our hearts. Jesus focuses first on the disciples' hearts. And now we're taking a look at the house part of the Father's house. Now, what is this house? What is the house of God? I mean, is there some place in space that we can travel to and, and find God's house? You know, let's take the Star Trek Enterprise and, like, go to a quadrant of space and, like, knock on God's door somewhere? Well, how does Scripture describe the house of God? How do we see this play out in other parts of Scripture? Well, first, take a look at 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. This is King Solomon. He says, Behold, I'm about to build a house for the name of my Lord my God, and dedicate it to him. The house that I am to build will be great, for our God is greater than all gods. God here commissioned King Solomon to build a place to sacrifice and to worship and to teach and instruct God's people. King Solomon called it a house. Later, at the end of King Solomon's life, he writes this in Ecclesiastes 5.1, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God being the temple. There were a couple of different places, buildings that God had commissioned his people to build, that he could have part of his glory and his presence reside as they offered sacrifice for sin and worshiped and were taught. In the wilderness of the Israelites wandering, it was called the tabernacle. It was basically just a giant glorified tent that they would gather around. And in the promised land with King Solomon, they built this temple, a more permanent structure to receive this. And what was God doing? I mean, was God actually dwelling there? Well, no. I mean, it would be intermittent. His 
presence would be there for a while and part of his glory would be there for a while and then it, it wouldn't be there. Really, it was just a foreshadowing of the substance of what he was talking about. It was just a foreshadowing of the substance of what God wanted to really communicate in his son. In Jesus, John 1.14, we have this amazing description of Jesus. It says, we've seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, with the Old Testament place, part of God's glory would dwell there from time to time. But in Jesus, the fullness of God's glory was revealed always. Revealed in a person. The person of Jesus. And now what is the house of God? That word house that we see in our text literally means a dwelling place. Right? There are other words that were used to describe families or households. But this meant an actual dwelling place. It's the word for mansion. I was reminded this morning by our team of the crazy weird song, My Father's House, lots and lots of rooms and playing football, and the late 90s crazy song. That's where they get it from, right here in our text. So what is this house of God? Well, if his glory and his person are revealed in a person, the person of Christ, what is his dwelling place? 1 Corinthians 3.16, the Apostle Paul says, Do you not know that you are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in you? He's talking to a church. He's talking to a people. God's people are His dwelling place. By His presence of His Holy Spirit. This building here, it's great. We love it. Before we gathered here, it produced windmills. The place is secondary to the people. It is the people that make the place the house of God because it is the people who are the house of God. Now, how do we express this in terms of us being a people? How has the church expressed this throughout history? Well, we'll look at the early church, and then we'll look briefly at our church. Because the house of God was now with his people, there's not one central place where they, Christians would gather. They would actually meet in the homes of the apostles and the church leaders for teaching, for worship. I mean, they'd have services almost identical to this one here. The homes of the Christians were where they gathered. And they weren't just small homes like you would get like in North Park, you know, no offense to North Parkians. But they're huge, man. I and mean, you could think of them almost like estates, right? Think of them almost like estates. And we have accounts as early as the two, three hundreds of people describing these early Christian gatherings. Okay? Here's one from the fourth century. It says, The master of the house welcomed us and led us to a certain apartment arranged like a theater and beautifully built. There we found considerable crowds waiting for us who had come during the night. Before long, the discussion was in full swing. I mean, this is an early account. I mean, going to one apartment of this, like, estate, the theater, beautifully built, great crowds, like this. I mean, these were the early Christians. They would gather in homes. Hospitality was so important. Extending that hospitality to outsiders and to strangers. Throughout the New Testament, we see many lists of people's homes where Christians would gather. Here's just a few. Jason, Thessalonica. Titius Justus at Corinth. Philip, Caesarea. Lydia, Philippi. Paul, Rome. I mean, the list goes on. We could name more of houses where Christians would gather for worship, extending the hospitality of the Father to the world around them. And I, and I finished with Paul here because he has a, we have a great account of really how he would employ this. The last couple years of his life were in house arrest in Rome, and he used his home as the staging area for his ministry. We have this 
about Paul. It says that he was no longer able to go out to preach the gospel, so he invited leading Jews to come to his residence for a full day of talk and discussion. His approach was superb. He took the initiative and explained the reason for his presence in Rome. Before they could produce any garbled account that may have reached them from Judea, he was brief, factual, conciliatory to the point. He offered them hospitality. He showed his understanding of the scriptures, his loyalty to the hope of Israel, and his deep conviction that in Jesus salvation was to be found. Sounds like our community groups, right? He took the initiative, bringing people into the home, offering hospitality. All of our community groups eat dinner together, sharing his deep conviction, that personal testimony of the work of the Lord in our lives, showing his understanding of the scriptures. And it's important for us to understand that the early church really used their homes as places to extend the hospitality of the Father, to really see the work of the gospel going out. Because I desire that we grow in this as well, both in our private homes and in our public homes. As I mentioned at the very beginning, we here at the Resolve Church take very seriously the role and the importance of hospitality in our church life. And we have a whole ministry called the hospitality ministry, don't we? I'm really proud of what they do. I think they do a, it's a bang-up job, wouldn't you say? They do such a good job of welcoming people into our church house and to providing a place for people to feel welcome and loved. But what if our hospitality ministry wasn't just the few people on it? And what if it was every single person here was on the hospitality team? Welcoming in new people. As you're experiencing the hospitality of the Father, you're extending that to those who are coming into our house. I love what the leader of our hospitality ministry, Elaine, wrote for her 2016 vision for the hospitality year. Just kind of show, show this off a little bit here. This is what she says. She says, my vision for hospitality uh, 2016 has two threads. One, if you've got a good smile and know how to be friendly to visitors, introducing them to a church, you'd be a great addition to our hospitality team. Everyone here has a great smile, so there you go. Two, uh, the second thread is really for everybody in our church. Whether or not you're officially on our team, I envision all of our church seeing themselves as on hospitality. Whether it's new friendships struck up over the coffee tables, intentionally making plans for lunch with new brothers and sisters, or introducing yourself to someone new, the ministry of hospitality is something that everyone can and ought to participate in. Welcoming strangers is part of gospel-centered living. And I love that last line. Welcoming strangers is part of gospel-centered living. And this is so true. This is what I've been talking about for these few minutes. This is what God has done for us. We were strangers, aliens, even enemies of God because of sin. And yet He makes us His family. He transforms enemies into sons and daughters, and He welcomes us in, and He provides for us. And guys, this isn't, this isn't a hard thing to do. It's actually quite simple. Just finding one new person you don't know yet, saying hi. Just one. Just one person. You don't need to be the most outgoing, gregarious person. Just say hi to one new person. It's easy. As one of my students says, it's easy peasy. You know, we're not really uh, a church that is interested in reinventing the wheels or finding the latest and greatest strategies for church health or church growth. We have everything we already need. It's worked for the earliest churches. It certainly worked for us now because we have the same Spirit of God dwelling in us, making us His house, a place where we can actually have the very felt presence of God among us, welcoming strangers. My desire is that we would be a healthy church. You know, we extend hospitality uh, of God to visitors and guests here in our gatherings, both publicly as well as privately in our homes. That we'd be a mature church as we individually mature in our thinking that God has given every single one of us homes to use for the work of the gospel, to minister to those who do not yet know Jesus. And that we would be a great church 
then we'd see an ever-increasing and ever-multiplying use of our homes throughout the city, that we would see an ever-increasing capacity to invite more and more people to our public gatherings that they might experience the hospitality of Christ. So let's begin to wrap up as we prepare for communion. In our first point, we looked at Grandma's house, right? We looked at the desirability of the Father's house and how it is a house that is gracious in its welcome. It's abundant in its provision. Jesus called troubled hearts. This morning, are you troubled? Are you anxious? Are you worried? Perhaps you have fear or doubt that's plaguing your mind, plaguing your heart. Experience the rest of the Father. The Father's house is a place of rest. A troubled heart can rest at ease in the Father's house. Perhaps this morning you're wrestling with sin. There's some sin you just, you're trying so hard to beat, you just can't. Whatever you're desiring in pursuing that sin, that desire is fully met at the Father's house. That desire is met in the richest and fullest abundance at the Father's house. Come to Jesus this morning. Come to him. And you will experience the gracious welcome of the Father. Perhaps it's the dorm room of our hearts. That you have a hard time really welcoming others into your life. Perhaps you have one of those fears or the self-protection, self-centeredness. You're afraid of others. They think about you. Look at the Father's gracious welcome. He desires you. He desires you. Otherwise, he would not have welcomed you into his house. Stop building walls around your heart. Trust the Lord Jesus. You can begin to relate with him in authenticity and openness without fear of judgment. Experience the transforming work of the gospel in those hurts, those broken places. You can begin to be honest with others as well. The authentic you is, is beautiful. Jesus thinks so. Perhaps some of you need to grow and get out of you being the center of your life and instead really seeing Jesus be the center of your life for he is worthy of that position. Perhaps you need to really, really see the hospitality of Christ to help bring others into that. You can begin to invest in other people. Lastly, we looked at our church house. Perhaps... We need to grow this morning in seeing our lives and our homes as the tool that God has used to help others know him, to help others experience this great hospitality of Christ. And in any of these cases, I invite you to come to Jesus this morning, to ask him, to seek him, and he will receive you, and he will welcome you in, an enemy turned friend a stranger, a welcome guest. Let's pray.